Good afternoon. Firstly, thank you very much, Chris, for the uh, kind introduction and thorough uh, review of my background. Uh, I guess that's uh, what one gets when you're 68 years of age. Uh, a lot of experience, and I've had uh, my share of it. So I'm uh, certainly uh, pleased to be before you here this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming and uh, for listening to what I have to say. Before I proceed, I too wish to acknowledge and uh, give respect to the uh, Coastal Salish peoples of this area, to the uh, Songhees First Nation and to the Esquimalt uh, uh, Nation, which is just next door to us right here. This is their traditional lands. And I honor and I hold my hands up high to the ancestors of these lands who protected these lands and these resources for all of us here to enjoy. My uh, Okanagan Silk's name is Simu. Simu in our language means connected to the land. My stem Tima, my grandmother gave that to me uh, when I was still a young boy, and she said that was something that very major significance because my ancestors, some of them carried that name. And I'm very proud to be connected to the land and to be chairman of the First Nations Lands Advisory Board across Canada and to work with lands matters, economic development matters with First Nations in particular across Canada. So it gives me great honor to carry my name. This is a uh, speaking series, series on uh, Indigenous economic development and reconciliation. My job, I believe, is to help build public and governmental understanding and capacity in the terms of awareness of Indigenous economic development perspective and land governance. A lot of what I've been doing in my work as chairman of the Lands Advisory Board, working with First Nations and assisting those First Nations into being government decision makers with lawmaking powers, is connected to reconciliation. So what is reconciliation? This means moving ahead and not being stuck in the past. It means the restoration of friendly relations. It's making one's belief compatible with another. First Nations to the public, to government. It's a coming together of cultures and people, and it's an understanding of what that means. The elements include several things, including truth, justice, healing, forgiveness with compassion. It's a closing of gap of inequities uh, uh, that, that have existed and what needs to be done. That's what the country is facing right now is reconciliation. To me, reconciliation to a large part is about recognizing First Nations as governments, as real substantive governments with lawmaking powers the jurisdiction to pass laws, to make their own decisions, to decide for themselves how they are going to protect their lands, develop their lands, respect their lands, while at all times upholding their culture. That's what it means to me. It's recognizing that First Nations were established societies and have been so for thousands and thousands of years, the first peoples of these lands. Today, First Nations want that resumption of self-governance authority that they enjoyed for thousands of years. And that's what First Nations want and Indigenous peoples want from my perspective and how I'm trying to relay it to you. So that is some of the consideration that I give when I think about reconciliation. I've been involved in a lot of negotiations in my time. I was a member of the First Nations Summit for four years and uh, worked for the chiefs and the communities here in this province to try and negotiate modern day treaties. So I've had a lot to do with reconciliation. Reconciliation hasn't moved very fast in this country. I've been involved for a long time, since about 1990, almost continuously, my First Nation was involved in reconciliation for an attempt for close to 15 years and we didn't resolve it. There was no settlement of land claims, no reconciliation. And I worked hard for the First Nation communities in this province from the First Nation perspective to say, let's reach a settlement. Let's get this thing resolved. Land claims, our indigenous rights, let's get clarity, let's get investments, let's make the people have a future. 
And I've been involved in that. So now into my presentation, because I believe a lot of what the land management work has done is about reconciliation. It's building capacity in First Nations governance and helping to right the wrong done to our peoples. So, I'm going to speak to you about some of the history in Canada involving First Nation peoples, the historic significance of this land management initiative, the purpose of the framework agreement on First Nation land ma management, and the resulting implementation of the community control over First Nation lands and resources. I want to talk to you about the roles that exists within the Lands Advisory Board and that the First Nation Land Management Resource Centre is an important aspect of that to administer that, and I'll cover that. How the Lands Advisory Board and the Resource Centre relate to other First Nation institutions. You've heard Chris explain the purpose of, of this series, and we are involved and work with other institutions. We are not an institution as a Lands Advisory Board, we are a collective group of First Nations that work together, not under the institutional capacity that is controlled by government. Other institutions are formed with government orders and councils and that sort of thing. We're not an institution, but we work with these institutions. I want to touch upon the evolution of the Lands Advisory Board and the Resource Centre since its inception of the Framework Agreement. The future collaborations with the province of British Columbia on BC's reconciliation initiatives. Some of the experiences we have time to touch upon, those First Nations that have been successful with their land codes, and of course, leave time for your questions. This here map that you see on the wall is, uh, shows you the extent of First Nations occupation in Canada from time immemorial. The first peoples of the lands and undeniably are First Nations Indigenous peoples. Historically, they're all self-governing. No one put laws over our ancestors. And that has been since time immemorial that this occupation of Canada from coast to coast has existed. Just uh, uh, a few days ago, Sunday, I traveled to Port St. John and met with the Doig River First Nation and met Monday and uh, was able to talk to the, them about their future and about land development and what they might want to do with their jurisdiction. One of the things I learned is a history. They showed me a cave uh, location that goes back estimated between 12,500 and 14,000 years. A cave where they have artifacts and paintings in. One of the oldest known occupational um, um, uh, evidence of occupation of First Nation peoples that exists in this province. And they have been there since that time, continuously occupying, occupying those lands. So when you talk about connecting to the lands and the First Nations involvement, that's where First Nations see themselves as being the first peoples and having the duty to respect and look after the lands and the resources. And that's where First Nation peoples are coming from. Since European contact, which is now from the somewhere in the 1600s thereabouts, probably less than 400 years, things have changed. There's been interaction with communities. One of the first things that the newly formed government of Canada did was pass the Indian Act in 1876. That was an attempt to consolidate all the previous acts, statutes, and policies into one body, one new reference point. It gave Canada that coordinated approach to Indian policy making, along with the justification to implement and to enforce those policies. Quite simply, it was about assimilation, turning the Indian into a white man. The role that indigenous culture and way of life into the white society was then meant to move into the modern, evolving society. Indians, we don't need you Indians as far as your culture, you need to be assimilated. 
and the Constitution Act that was passed, the framework of the legislation where everything arrives, derives from in Canada is the Constitution Act of 1867. That Constitution, through Section 9124, gave Canada the authority to legislate over all matters related to Indians and lands reserved for Indians. The Indian Act was the expression of this authority. Now, what some of you may find a bit odd, there was absolutely zero, no consultation with First Nation peoples when that Indian Act was passed. There is no evidence that I've seen in the history of Canada that talks about consultation. It was simply an imposed will by the then government to say, Indians, you've got to assimilate. As I know, you're all aware, the first Prime Minister of Canada was Sir John A. Macdonald. In 1887, he stood up in Parliament and he talked about the Indian Act. And this is exactly the words that he said when he talked about the Indian Act and what was government's intention. He said, the great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects with the other inhabitants of the Dominion as speedily as they are fit to change. That clearly enunciated the policies and what it meant to Indigenous peoples of Canada. The legacy of that Indian Act exists, and I'm sure you're probably somewhat familiar with le that legacy. It's been in the news and you've heard about it, and I'm sure most of you have read about it. Um, the Indian Act has been deemed to be paternalistic. Uh, if you were a band member, you needed permission to leave the Indian Reserve. You could not sell your wood that you may have cut to raise monies or your hay without the Indian agent saying you could do so. You needed permission sometimes to leave the reserve. The children were generally put into residential schools, and you know the legacy there. It's very clearly captivated in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, and there's a lot of healing and forgiveness that is there and, and is still needed. There's recognition of that. First Nation peoples were enfranchised, meaning they lost their Indian status. They were no longer an Indian. I've received a degree, for example, in law. Had I been born and uh, surviving in that late 1800s, early 1900s, the moment I would have obtained that degree, I would have automatically been enfranchised. I would have lost my Indian status, no longer recognized as an Indian person. That is a fact, and that's what happened to some of our peoples. We were forbade as uh, First Nations, Indigenous peoples, to form political organizations. It was against the law to do so. We were prevented legally from pursuing land claims. We did not have the right to go to court prior to 1951 with an amendment to the legislation that allowed for that. Many of the ancestors here, the coastal Salish peoples in particular that practiced their potlatches and culture were jailed for having potlatches, for giving their wealth to others as part of their status. And they were jailed for it. Their ceremonies were declared illegal. They could not speak their tongue in residential schools. And I know lots of stories, or heard lots of stories of the results that have happened from that. We did not have the right to vote federally until the passage of the Bill of Rights Act in 1960. So that is not really that long ago. All of this under the premise that indigenous peoples had to be assimilated. So now, looking at the history of land management, when you look through the Indian Act, you look through some of the history, there's, there's certain um, things that, uh, there are, that First Nations are allowed to do. The Indian Act is really a regulatory bought, uh, a piece of uh, legislation that dictates that the master in control as a federal government, as represented by the Department of Indian Affairs. The authority rested with the Department of Indian Affairs to the Indian agents and the superintendents, the ministers and governors and councils, all within the federal government domain. 
There were some changes put into the Indian Act that allowed a form of delegation of authorities in land management. Two of those sections are section 53 and section 60. I was involved uh, in the early stages to help move the development of land management across Canada. And it started really with a lawsuit by my community, the West Bank First Nation, while I was chief in the 1980, 1986 and 87 era, when they revoked West Bank's then called Indian Bands Land Management Authorities over a lot of misgivings and, uh, and uh, uh, reviews of the previous councils of the day and uh, the real injustice that was happening in the community. They formed the Hall Commission and inquired into the affairs of West Bank. When they revoked our authorities, one of the first tasks I did as an upcoming new chief was to call that meeting and we had 100% turnout of every member voting that had the right to vote on our reserve that came out to that meeting. At the end of the meeting, the direction was clear. You, chief and council, bring a lawsuit to get the land management authorities, even though they were delegated back to the hands of the West Bank Indian Band. So I started that process. Two years, we were really at the, foot, uh, st uh, the steps of the courthouse, basically, with all the arguments ready, the arguments ready to go, and I received a call from the Department of Indian Affairs uh, assistant uh, minister at, the, at that time, um, and the request was, Chief, we would like to settle with you. We'll re we would like to return your land management delegated authorities. We discussed that. I agreed on certain conditions. One, pay us the monies that we spent to fight this lawsuit. Secondly, make this thing happen very, very quickly. They came back and they said, Chief, we would like you to make some recommendations to us as Canada. We, we're doing this lands and reserves and trust study, and we're looking for recommendations, and we'd like to hear from you as to what you would suggest that we do with land management under the Indian Act. So I agreed, they put some muddies together, and I started the, the process. And I worked with the other 5360 authority bands, there were nine First Nations only across Canada, and we started that process. The result was a framework agreement on First Nation land management. We looked at funding, yes, and we worked out arrangements as to what proper funding might be. All of that took place in the negotiations, but then we looked further. We said, do we want to be under the Indian Act? Do we want to do just amendments to the Indian Act? We want something more than that. And it was agreed that we wanted the inherent right to manage our own affairs. At that same point in the history of time, there was a new government change. The liberal, then new liberal government came in and they campaigned on the premise that they were going to recognize the inherent rights of First Nations. When we approached them on that, they had nothing to offer. So we offered this. We said, you as a government, you've said, you've campaigned on the premise that you want to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples, the inherent right. Well, this is what you can do. We want the inherent right to manage our own affairs, our own reserves, our lands and resources under our governmental control, not yours. The agreement was reached February 12th in 1996 a government-to-government -government agreement was reached, and thus the land code formations and the development of land management for First Nations. What provided that leverage, of course, was the amendments that took place with the Constitution in 1982 and 1984. Sections 25 and Section 35, those sections are very important sections to Indigenous peoples and the rights of Indigenous peoples. They recognize Indigenous rights, they recognize treaties and land claims. They uh, recognize First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples as indigenous peoples with certain rights in this country. It paved the way for the recognition of Aboriginal title, where the Supreme Court of Canada now has ruled that Aboriginal title does exist. Title and Aboriginal's name rests with First Nation communities that have occupied those lands the right to resume self-governance. That's what the Constitution provided. So, with our initiative, reconciliation began. 
The framers agreements uh, really is a conscious effort to shed the outdated Indian Act from our lives, to take away those land restrictive provisions that ruled us, to set aside those practices, policies and procedures, and to take charge ourselves. This here picture that you see here on the screen is a, a very historic one. This is uh, then Chief uh, Bill McHugh at the uh, Chippewas of Georgina Island. This was the historic signing of that framework agreement on First Nation land management. As a chairman and uh, as a participating member, the framework agreement is really where the principles are contained as to what we want to see with lawmaking. So Minister Ron Irwin is on the far right of the screen and the chiefs uh, at the, of that time and those involved, including myself, were there, originally driven by 14 First Nation communities. It was the first real recognition of the inherent right being recognized to manage our own lands and our own resources. A good friend of mine that uh, passed on is very well recognized. Uh, some or many of you may know uh, of him, Chief Joe Mathias of the Squamish Nation. He was part of this process as we were moving to get government to make changes and to advance reconciliation. He made this comment when legislation was finally passed, when they recognized the government to government framework agreement and just before the turn of the millennium into the year 2000, he said, when this was accepted by Kennedy, he said, this may be the single most historic accomplishment for First Nations this century. To have First Nations recognized as governments with their own lawmaking powers and control over their own lands. So this was the enabling of First Nations to once again be self-governing, to resume control over their lands and their resources, and to replace those restrictive, outdated provisions of the Indian Act. This here slide basically gives you uh, uh, um, a diagram overview of the process. Here you see the Frank Agreement, which contains the principles that we negotiated with Canada in that government-to-government -government agreement in 1996. The bottom of the screen, you see the land code. That is the laws that the First Nations will start as their framework of laws for the future. It's like the Parliament of British Columbia having its, uh, its uh, legal work done and you have all of the statutes and regulations and everything else follows the land code's the beginning. Lawmaking starts from that. It describes how it can and should be done and what it must contain has to be a community ratification. It's an opting in process. No First Nations is forced into incremental self-government. They have to choose it, want it. And they have to have a community vote to vote whether or not the people want it. And there's an individual agreement that has to be signed that describes how much monies they're gonna get for land management, what the land description uh, they have on the reserves and environmental issues. And on the government side, they have to pass and ratify that framework agreement and they did so in 1999, June of 1999, by passing the First Nation Land Management Act. Thus, the process. So, what do First Nation land codes mean to those First Nations that choose to pass and implement those land codes? Firstly, it unshackles communities from the Indian Act. It means that First Nations resumes their inherent right as a recognized governmental decision maker over their lands and their resources. It gives full recognition to First Nation lawmaking powers and jurisdiction. So an operational First Nation can exercise those governmental powers without outside government interference. That's reconciliation and that's advancement of First Nations. It also replaces the Indian Act provisions with these laws that puts decision-making back into the hands of the community and its members. Reserve lands can never be diminished in size. There can no longer be expropriation of roads or rights of ways for hydro lines, things of that. There cannot be that automatically. It has to have consultation. It has to have the consent of the First Nation peoples. No more lands to be taken from the reserves that have included in the past thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of lands that have been taken away from First Nations, even after the reserves 
have been set up, a wrong that had to be remedied. And this is what it does to protect that expropriation process. It provides increased accountability to the members and the citizens of that First Nation community. And it, how, it helps allow decision making to take place at the speed of business. How is a governmental federal official going to handle land management authorities and move ahead with developments when you've got 633 First Nations across Canada representing uh, a million people and you've got a handful of people that are going to do that for First Nations? Not possible. Not in this day and age. Speed of business means you need to make decisions when they have to be met if you want to pursue economic development. And if you're restricted and if you have to have the permission and the consent of the minister and the governor and council and go through months and years of regulatory compliance, you're not going to move ahead too fast. So this changes that. First Nations get to decide their own future and implement what they want to see over their lands and resources, not to be handheld or dictated to by government. The benefits have been amazing. Quicker decision making, being able to make decisions and to move ahead at the speed of business, strengthening a First Nation values and visions, provides a more coordinated community focus undoubtedly, protects legal interests, it recognizes the First Nations as governments, it provides more flexibility, better lease terms that First Nations can negotiate for their lands if they wish to develop, better accountability, accountability to its membership, not to no one else, but to their own communities, recognizing the interests and being accountable to third parties who might live, indigenous or not, on First Nation lands. It's enabled better relationships with financial institutions and it's allowed for the uh, increased ability to borrow for capital investments. And I, of course, as you've heard, I'm the chairman and director of PCL's Trust Financial and I deal with financial matters and assist in the providing of loans to First Nations, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And I can tell you that this institution, the PCL's Trust Institution, along with the other major banks in Canada, all want to see First Nations with governing authorities because that's where the money rests with security. That's why they want to lend. And they asked me continuously, what's the latest number of First Nations? Who's now operational? Who are you working with to develop, to, to get into self-government? These are the people we want to talk to because these are the people we're going to approach when we want to lend them monies. And it's increased that, I can assure you. So there's been a lot of internal and external investments. We did some independent studies and uh, commissioned uh, uh, one of the uh, larger groups in Canada, KPMG, to do reports and they've studied and examined whether or not land codes and self-governance is working. Has it worked? The answer, overwhelmingly, yes. Hundreds of millions, soon to be billions, if not billions, have been generated. First Nations are moving ahead really at the speed of business. And no First Nation yet who has passed the land code that I have heard in Canada, and I deal with First Nations right across this country, not one has said, we made a mistake, we should not be self-governing. Not one will go back to the controls of the Indian Act. Even if they could, they would not. And KPMG has confirmed that. And the investment has been significant to allow this to happen. Government has supported this. Why? Because they get a return on their investment. Up to 10 times the return of monies that they put into it comes out in economic benefits with jobs, employment opportunities, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. So it's really moved the needle in a very positive way. So the first three First Nations that passed their land codes did so at the turn of the millennium. When 2000 struck midnight, when it, we had a new century, three First Nations had their land codes passed and they paved the way for others to follow. Chippewas of Georgina Island in Ontario, Mississaugas of Scugog Island, again in Ontario, and uh, Muscaday First Nation in Saskatchewan. All had their laws passed by the community and they took effect at the striking of midnight going into 2000. So that was historic. 
Ultimate goals served by the French Agreement on Land Management is, is that we want to have all First Nations aware of the option to exercise their right to govern their lands, to have this as an option if they choose to follow. Each community would decide how to govern its lands and resources under its own culture. There has to be effective land and resource governance, uh, and that is the, really the cornerstone of decolonization. That's where it begins, having that control and lawmaking. That government-to-government -government relationships will strengthen Canada and First Nations and the people of Canada. And each First Nation must have sufficient resources to govern its reserved lands and resources effectively. These are all parts of the negotiations and what part of that outcome has been. So, First Nations involved. The French Agreement has been historically and extremely successful in getting First Nations into, sec into sectoral self-government from coast to coast in this country. As of December of 2019, we had 94 First Nations that became operational with incremental self-governments who had now have the full power and controls over their lands and their resources, lawmaking powers, unfettered without intervention by federal and provincial governments. In British Columbia, we have 51 First Nations that have that incremental power and it's growing on a year-by-year -year basis. Three of our First Nations have moved from incremental First Nation governance to more full self-governance, including my community at West Bank, including the Tawasan community and Slayaman. All were land code First Nations that have moved on to further self-governance. And it's continuing to happen. Presently, there are uh, 35 First Nations in the developmental phase of getting their communities ready for a vote, developing their land codes. 39 First Nations are temporarily, at their choosing, inactive, waiting for their own communities' change in priorities. And 61 First Nations are waitlisted for this opportunity. I receive calls on a weekly basis by First Nations wanting to get involved. This across Canada that are in the uh, operational or developmental phase, so it really covers from Vancouver Island right through to Newfoundland. What are the main success uh, factors for having a successful frame agreement? Why did this happen? Well, three things, uh, four things perhaps. One, the process was designed by First Nations. Government didn't tell us what we wanted to do. We had to come up with that thinking ourselves. We designed it, we came up with the ideas, and we presented to government, you need to recognize inherent rights of First Nations. We have to have this authority. We have to be recognized governments. It was designed by our communities. Historically, it was negotiated as a government-to-government -government agreement with Canada. It continues and remains to be First Nation driven. The minister and the prime minister and anyone else doesn't tell us what we need and have to do. It's our communities that direct us and we advance this and it remains self-driven in that perspective. It enables First Nation communities to develop and enact key land laws, land laws and tools under their own form of governance with the land code. This process uh, just basically describes the two functions. My role as chairman of the Lands Advisory Board is really the political role. My counterpart is uh, former Chief Austin Bear, who chairs the Resource Centre, and it was created to discharge, discharge the uh, Lands Advisory Board's technical and support service functions to the First Nations that wanted to develop land codes or who became operational. So this slide here really gives a little bit more of a perspective of it. I'm elected uh, uh, by the chiefs in Canada who are operational. They need to choose a chairman. They've chosen me. I've been chairman since day one, and some point in time, they'll choose another chairman. We have 15 board members that are operational, and it's regionally represented. Uh, British Columbia being one region, Prairies being another, and of course, uh, 
uh, includes the Northwest Territories now and in the east. Uh, we haven't moved, we, ha we are in the Maritimes, but it's considered part of the east. And at some point in time, it may be that we'll expand to the Maritimes with another region. It supports the First Nations in accordance with the principles contained in the Framework Agreement. That's my role, and that's how I operate and how our lands board operates with the operational First Nations. And the Resource Center, of course, again, the administrative technical body, it does the day-to-day -day, day -day operations. It handles the monies that are received from Canada. It directs those monies to the First Nations. It does administrative and technical advice and support services to the First Nations involved. So what's been the progress and what's our future of the Lands Advisory Board and the Resource Centre? So since 1996, and since the passage of legislation in 1999, we've moved from 14 First Nations to 165 that are actual signatories. Right now, I deal with uh, directly or indirectly with 227, give or take, uh, First Nations uh, on a daily or a monthly basis. Three signatories have moved on to full self-government or treaty, modern day treaty. And we have many communities who want to be involved. The budget of 2018 of the federal government committed to add 50 new signatories uh, over a five year period. And uh, that was done in 2018. And I'm expecting more signatories before April 1st, hopefully of this year, to be allowed to be developmental and to be supported by government so we can finance them to, to get into development all phase so they can develop their land codes, their laws, and then vote and see if they pass it. We have a strategic business plan, five-year plan, and our objective is to make all First Nations that want to be aware of it to know that they have the opportunity and they can be part of this land management process. And it's up to each First Nation to decide how they wish to govern their lands. We have the basic principles contained in the framework agreement that they would follow. We want to ensure and assist that they have the capacity to be able to govern their own lands and their resources, the environment, making environmental laws and things of that nature. We want to ensure that there's effective land, environment, and resource governance in place, so that they know how to govern. It's been a long time for some. And of course, the decolonization, community by community, of this process. And indeed, it is a government to government relationship, and there's been a lot of strengthening as a result of that, and a lot of capacity building. We've done six amendments to the Framework Agreement since uh, uh, 1996. Uh, we're working on our seventh amendment right now with Canada. We're looking at now of enhancing the authorities even further, and that would include things like control of oil and gas interests to uh, deal with wills and estates, to deal with land registration matters, to recognize and to implement Aboriginal title, and, and having authority and jurisdiction over First Nation traditional lands. That's a broad objective, and that's what our objective is. You've heard of the Supreme Court of Canada case, the William case, the Honeywoodin case north of, uh, of Williams Lake. The Supreme Court of Canada said they have Aboriginal title to their lands. The problem is there is a vacuum that exists over those hundreds of thousands of acres that have now been recognized. Who has the jurisdictional control over those lands? The Supreme Court of Canada has said the Forestry Act of the province doesn't apply, so what does apply? We've said we can have this clarity if we have an amendment to the Frank Agreement and to legislation which allows for the First Nations to be involved over their traditional territories and Aboriginal title lands. This is a broad concept, and we're moving and we're serious on that. We're looking at funding issues now, longer-term funding. Ten-year funding has been uh, talked about by government, and we're in that process right now. Funding with built-in escalations, not where parties are given dollars in 20 or 25 years later, there is no, uh, no further dollar, and you're living with, uh, with uh, 20 years of, uh, of, uh, of uh, non-increase. That doesn't fly in today's age. We're looking at renewing the, 
the, the First Nation Land Management Act to make it more consistent with reconciliation, which means that they follow the principles contained in that government-to-government -government framework agreement from 1996. The legislation has generally followed it, but there are sections in it which Canada has put in certain language that complicates it or confuses it. And we are saying as First Nation peoples, we need clarification. It could be made much clearer, and we're working to ensure that. And it will go a long ways, I can assure you, towards reconciliation by recognizing what really truly was negotiated and agreed to by government. So, we have been working with other institutions, as I previously mentioned, that we have a protocol agreement in place with the, uh, the uh, First Nations Financial Management Board, with the First Nations Finance Authority, and with the First Nations Tax Commission. And that protocol agreement really outlines the respect that we must give to one another, that we have individual initiatives, be it legislative, political, technical, or organizational mandates, but we agree to be cooperative with one another, to work with one another to support our endeavors. And collectively, we believe we are stronger as an entity by doing so. We want to facilitate further opportunities for greater economic development and growth within First Nation communities, and include some important points like new infrastructure being designed and developed, uh, increased revenue opportunities. This is what we're working on. If a government is going to be recognized as a government, you have to have revenue-making capacity, whether it's a power to tax, to raise money, to share uh, automatically in renewable or non-renewable resources, that's what is needed, and that's what reconciliation must uh, be, be directed towards if there's going to be a satisfactory advancement of reconciliation in this country. That's what we're working on. New economic development opportunities. We want to see uh, increased fiscal and administrative independence from other governments. Several years ago, as being chief, I uh, made a proposal to the then Minister of Indian Affairs, and I said to the minister that we wanted to be totally independent fiscally with Canada. We don't need any more dollars from you for social services or health or education or whatever. We don't need it, provided, provided we had control of our own taxation that flows from the reserve, hundreds of millions of dollars of that from our population of over 10,000 people with businesses and everything else. We wanted to have a, a good share of that. And with that, the proposal we had was, Mr. Minister, Canada, we are totally independent. We don't need a cent from you. We will create our own governmental authorities and run like that. That would have been amazing. It hasn't happened yet, but it's still a dream that I have. Improved financial management, improved administrative efficiency. We talked about the 10-year um, uh, funding applications now. And the thing is to include positive actions to support climate change. It's a big topic. A lot of work has to be done in the First Nations as government authorities must be prepared for it and must work towards that climate change because it will affect the lives of their peoples. Environmental integrity is all part of that process. So. What about collaboration? What about collaboration with this province, with other provinces? What about BC's reconciliation initiatives? Well, right now, as you all know, uh, this province is working towards legislation that will further develop the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. UNDRIP legislation, they call it. That is happening, and it needs to happen, in my opinion, quicker. It's been delayed, I suspect, because of roadblocks and all the, and the uh, pipeline issues and things of that nature. It may have damaged some of the movement, but it still needs to be done. Collaboration with the government, with First Nations, means revenue generating capacity, having the power to create wealth. This is what I see happening and why we're working with these other institutions to make it happen. And we want to have a right to the renewable and non-renewable natural resources. We need royalties. 
The First Nations claim ownership of this country through their rightful claim as being the First Nation peoples. They feel they have a right to the forest. They protected the forest and the minerals and what's contained in it, the fish and the wildlife for centuries, for thousands of years. They should have a say as to how it's going to be developed or how it's going to be spent. And there has to be a balancing of that. That's reconciliation. Authorities, perhaps in things like gaming, jurisdiction over things of uh, revenue generating capacity that might include cannabis and the sale and growing of cannabis. Uh, uh, having the uh, BC Indian Resources Minerals Act of precious metals, making sure that First Nations have a right to that and not having that saying by the government that they control all the precious metals, even on reserve lands, nonsensical from First Nation perspective, I can assure you. No one on WFN lands, for example, is going to claim the mineral rights that might exist, gold or otherwise, uh, that exists on those lands and say that the BC Indian Resource Minerals Act prevents you from ownership and having the right to mine that or to take advantage of that. That is nonsensical. And these are some of the things that reconciliation has to do to change. Water. Who has the rights to water? First Nations say they have the rights to water. That's a big topic, and there's got to be a lot of discussion about that. Expanding, as I mentioned, the traditional, uh, 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 traditional ownership and, in, uh, and, um, and advancements for jurisdiction over Aboriginal title lands and having further powers of enforcement. All big topic areas. This slide uh, carries on uh, some of the parcel fabric renewals. Uh, there are still existing reserve boundary disputes that exist. Certain reserves have not clarity on their boundaries uh, after, uh, in some cases, over 100 years. Uh, there's still some old railway line beds that still exist in the federal government that need to be transferred to the First Nations. Uh, changing of rivers and erosion and, uh, and boundary changes. There's some differences. They have to be sorted out. So there's going to be further uh, collaboration with the province to resurvey some of those lands and to develop a resolution process where required. And this needs to happen. Involvement with the BC Roads Committee. There's a lot of roads that you may not be aware of that doesn't have proper orders and councils. There are some rights of ways for BC hydro lines and so forth that are problematic because they're not in the right spot. These are some of the issues that have to be cleared up. So there's work from um, ISIS, the, uh, the uh, Department of Indian Affairs, British Columbia, Natural Resources Canada, and our Lands Board and Resource Centre to help assist to resolve some of these issues. Issues sometimes created by Order and Council 1036. 1036, for those of you who may not be familiar, was Order and Council passed by the province in 1938, and it was a process where much of the reserve lands were finally recognized after long been ad advanced in the uh, mid to 1980s to 1986. In that time frame, they didn't get to become reserves until 1938. Finally, the Order and Council, but there was a right that the province re uh, retained to resume up to 5%. Of the, of the lands. And there's a lot of issues that have developed from that. These are still, in many respects, outstanding and they need to be clarified. This is part of the collaboration with the province to reconcile. So that, ladies and gentlemen, gives a uh, broad overview. I have uh, remaining here some success stories here and I don't want to go and spend too much time. I want to allow enough time for questions and. Uh, hopefully give you uh, answers that, uh, that, I, that I have maybe for you. Very quickly, I'll just refer you to some of the First Nations in this province who have land codes that have furthered themselves. Some of these areas you'll be aware of perhaps Vancouver Island, Stumanus, 65-acre Oyster Bay master plan development. They've got a lot of uh, commercial activity, uh, credit unions, uh, motel suites, uh, uh, residential development, uh, awards, uh, 400 to 600 jobs been created there at Stumanus, Giacton at, at uh, Chilliwack, 
very successful, heavy into uh, residential development in the process of developing 1,200 residential homes that they're selling in the open market. Uh, at the time of this uh, preparation, there was 400 units planned for construction, uh, and that uh, much of that has developed. Uh, another successful community not far from here, uh, the Sauk or Souk First Nation, heavy into solar power, one of the most solar intensified communities in Canada on First Nation lands. They've been very successful with the, uh, their uh, 82 hectare oyster farm development, producing over 3 million oysters and agreements they've reached with Asia to sell their product. Uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the wasabi greenhouses that they developed uh, and the, and the um, ocean farming that's taken place, they've been very successful in that regard. A lot of this they attribute to the land code and having the powers to do certain things, to make their own decisions. Seabird Island outside of Hope, be between uh, Harrison Hot Springs and Hope, another progressive community. Developments happening there, agriculture, uh, eco-station facilities, uh, aggregate businesses, uh, wheat and vegetables, hazelnut farm, truffle farm, and a number of things are happening there. These are just a handful of the success stories. So, in closing, we deal and are very active with one out of three First Nations in Canada. We work with them to assist them, to help reconcile their differences and to advance their lawmaking powers. Hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars have been contributed into the Cana overall Canadian economy. Thousands and tens of thousands of jobs have been created by these communities and there's been a lot of wealth, 10 times investment by Canada at what KPMG has estimated. Pretty significant. That's a pretty good investment by Canada to invest in First Nations. There has to be clarity in this province. If this province and Canada is going to advance, there has to be a working relationship. There has to be a balance of that recognition. That's what reconciliation is, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening to me. It's been an honor to be before you. Lim Lim, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for uh, a very engaging and enlightening presentation. We're going to move now into question period. For the questions, we're going to run mics to you. We would ask that you uh, wait for it to arrive, uh, speak clearly, and uh, allow everyone to hear your question so they get some context for Robert's answers. Um, with that, let's begin. Hi, and on behalf of the crowd, thanks again. Uh, my name is Trevor. I, I didn't know about any of this stuff. So I guess my, my, my question is a sort of a BC versus rest of Canada question, in that we understand that like there were treaties across most of Canada and basically, other than a couple up north, not in BC. So when you spoke about the, the process uh, expanding out to include traditional uh, like off-reserve lands, is that something that could only happen in BC or could also be happening in other parts of Canada? It could happen in other parts of Canada. Uh, I think the uh, courts have uh, opened it up, particularly to those that are non-treaty First Nations. And uh, I would estimate that it, probably one-third of the First Nations in Canada are non-treaty, most of which resides within the province of British Columbia. There's a Douglas Lake Treaty, of course, or Douglas uh, Treaty here on Vancouver Island that you're probably aware of, and you've got Treaty Number 8 in the uh, northern regions, but other than that, no other treaties exist other than the modern-day treaties that uh, Slamon and uh, Tawasson have, uh, have recently entered into. So, yes, uh, there is... Uh, it doesn't necessarily apply just to British Columbia. It can apply to other communities. There are other communities that certainly don't have treaties in, in Canada as well. Hi.
Hi, yeah, thank you. I'll echo, echo that sentiment. I'm curious how um, you see local governments and regional districts, municipalities, fitting into this process um, and supporting. Well, well thank you. Um, I think local governments, uh, I think all forms of government have to be involved in uh, when we're, if you're talking and referring to reconciliation and, uh, and advancing of, of things, because I think there's overlapping. Uh, I mean, just look around us here right now, uh, look at Esquimalt and look at Songhees. There's probably uh, water issues, water pipe issues, uh, power issues, uh, sewage issues, uh, water drainage issues. So there has to be involvement by those governments that are First Nations and the city of Victoria and Esquimalt. So, automatically uh, there, there has to be uh, involvement and um, I think this is uh, something that has to continue I know in the past in in dealing with land referrals for example it's a it's a big issue uh, land referrals might be uh, any lands that are crown lands or uh, watershed lands where everyone is impacted uh, too much water in the mountains could cause floods uh, First Nations municipal governments and uh, and the, those that are involved have to be uh, dealing with some of those issues. So I think those are uh, very significant. So there's no getting away of having uh, municipal governments not being involved in one form or another. So to carry on from the local government thing, um, when, when you were talking about um, a, a revenue creation, you didn't mention property taxes. Yes. Well, property taxes uh, is a major thing, um, an example. My community at West Bank uh, has over 10,000 residents right now. Uh, somewhere in the area between 14 and 15 million dollars annually is collected on property taxes, all going into the hands of the First Nations. Some of that money is shared with regional district uh, and with uh, municipal type services, fire protection, that sort of thing. And most of it is retained by the First Nation community. So it is a revenue generating capacity, certainly in communities like West Bank. Other communities, for example, it may be in the far north, uh, some of the more rural areas, they don't have development. Therefore, do they need taxation? Are they gonna get taxation without taxing their people? Not too likely. So. It is a revenue generating capacity for sure for the urban communities and uh, a great number of the First Nations that are urbanly centered um, from coast to coast First Nations have property taxation in place now. So in other cases, uh, it may not be just property tax, it may be social services tax, for example. My community, for example, uh, is not totally exempt as band members from taxation. Any booze that's purchased, alcohol, there is that um, GST component equivalent that goes to the First Nation. Any tobacco sales, that GST portion equivalent goes to the First Nation. Uh, fuel sales, the same thing. And other communities have different aspects of taxation. So these are all revenue generating capacities. So these are, these are, uh, these are th th in some cases, very significant for some of the communities. But having said that, it's not enough to survive. You know, as a government, there has to be more than that. It cannot be just, well, what can we tax within? It has to be more broadly looked at. And, and so if you're a First Nation person, and if you were part of a community that's been on those lands for thousands of years, and you look up on the road, and you see all these highway trucks coming down, logging trucks, tearing all the wood off there, and you say, I don't have a share of that. We fought for these lands. You know, we had wars, intertribal wars, to protect these lands and so forth. And uh, we need a share of that. The minerals uh, that might come from their pressures or not, isn't there a right to have a share of, of that? These are things that are uh, additional revenue capacity, and that's what has to happen. This government, federally and provincially, have to find arrangements to accommodate those matters so that there's an automatic right that's what I see in reconciliation. I'll go one step further, uh, and, I, and I'm looking at the pipelines, for example. There could be a quick and easy, clean settlement if the government says, all right, First Nations, 
You indigenous peoples now have ownership, but with that you have ownership responsibilities of those rights of ways and those pipelines. That, in my opinion, can solve a lot because I think First Nations would have a different perspective. Whether or not you're for or against pipelines, I don't know, but I see there has to be a balance, and I think that uh, that would be a clear definition and a clear immediate, in my opinion, solving of a lot of the issues by having this ownership. When you have ownership, you have responsibilities. And, and uh, if you have responsibilities, they've got to be exercised for the good and the will of, of everyone. Community members, just like you, need jobs. They need a future. Their, their children need an education. And if jobs can be created and wealth uh, developed from monies and royalties, why not? That's good governance, in my opinion. And I think these are some very typical quick-solving solutions if governments would wake up and people would understand that this would be better for everyone. And there can be fairness here. Equity division, I think, could happen. So I've said my piece in, in, in that regard, and I'm hoping that governments will see their way and First Nations collectively will see their way to say, let's really get reconciliation, let's get this country moving in the right direction. Be mindful of the culture, be mindful of the environment. All has to be considered undoubtedly, but there has to be a future as well, and the future means in some cases jobs and employment and education and all those types of things. So collaboratively, sure, a lot of work could be done. I just hope it all happens in a quicker pace. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Susan Lowe. I'm from the Housing Policy Branch. Uh, previously worked with Chris's group. Uh, my question is about small reserve lands. And uh, for example, here in Victoria, the song he's in Esquimalt, their reserve lands are very geographically small. And I wonder if there's anything considered or in the works to consider what if the size of the reserve doesn't have uh, the, the revenue generating capacity to meet the current and future needs of that population. What can be done? I mean, you can't generate, there's no forestry to be had on the Songhees reserve lands. Um, you know, there's no pipelines that can run through the Esquimalt reserve lands. They're, they're basically city blocks in size. So how do we provide a land code that actually allows them to be not just self-governing but self-supporting? Well, let's just look around for a moment. Um, let's look at uh, Songhees and the Squimalt and Souk and Beecher Bay and communities like that, Say Out, uh, uh, Jackson, I mean, some of these other communities that are right close by. Some of those communities, again, like you say, are very small in size, reserve size. Yes, there's only so much development you can have uh, put in place if you don't have that much acreage. But if you consider there's still resources out there, you just have to look into the waters and the oceans and look at the fish. You look at uh, places like New Zealand with Maori, they reached a settlement uh, there with the Maori people. Uh, they, the Maori people now have a great percentage of all of the fisheries uh, around New Zealand. And they, they, and they raise monies from that resource and they put monies into trust funds and that sort of thing to advance. So, if I were a community here with a small land base, I would look to the ocean and say, I want a share of that ocean. I want a share of the resources there. And if the uh, ships are gonna be taking oil uh, and it's gonna be going through these channels here, I wanna make sure I got my royalty and it says that if I'm gonna be uh, affected or damaged by my fishing rights and uh, way of life and sustenance, I better have a share of that. These are the types of things I think could be done very easily and very quickly. Thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Rob Dresky. I work with Indigenous Relations. And we've been involved for 20 years now in, in negotiations and in, in the fiscal side. And I'm very interested in seeing uh, the studies you talk about in terms of KPMG and the return on investment. A, a question about uh, capacity. Um, when First Nations take on land code and you have a resource center that goes with it, 
Um, do you have a, a sense, or does the Resource Centre provide uh, guidance in terms of what you need to staff up, what you need to, what, what you need for facilities, what you need, and actually to, to deliver on, on program and services on on local reserves? Like, how much, how many people are working at West Bank, specific to land management? Okay. Yes. Uh, good question. Uh, a couple of questions in there, I suppose. Uh, um, when we're looking at capacity development, uh, every First Nation is slightly different in one way or another. Uh, and some of that capacity may be greater in one community over another. So the Resource Centre uh, assists with that capacity development. I've seen communities that have passed land codes that really had no land management experience, but they wanted to have a change. They wanted to say, if we're going to do anything with these lands, it better be under our guidance and for the simple fact that government can no longer expropriate, that's pretty significant. So some of these communities with little to no land management experience dived into it. They passed their land codes. Today, they're starting to thrive. Some of them may be more active than others. Some of them may be rural. Some of them may be far north. And I know communities that are into the resource sector and forestry and so forth, and they've uh, looked to the forests and they've uh, and they've uh, built some logging companies and sustainable programs of tree planting and all that sort of thing, and they've benefited if they're in far north, if they have that resources. Others have looked at aggregates or other non-renewable development. So each community, of course, is, uh, is, is, is different in, in that regard. So generally, I've seen um, uh, instances where our resource center will bring in some of our land management people that are experienced and say, this is how you set up an office. This is what you need. Uh, this, is, uh, this is how you develop your laws. Here's a, here's a stack of precedent laws. Maybe there's something in here. Maybe it's zoning, maybe it's land use planning, maybe it's environment, maybe it's uh, enforcement provisions or things of that nature, whatever land management encompasses are provided to them and, and then the communities are able to go through it and learn. So capacity is developed. I've seen other communities, West Bank, my community has been in land management now for many decades and uh, right now we have a very capable staff uh, equal or, or exceed uh, anything that the federal or provincial government has. We can react fast, we can react to uh, issues, investment proposals or land development proposals and make decisions fast without going through the bureaucracy. We can cut out the, bureauc the bureaucracy and the tape that exists with Indian Affairs, federal government and audits and all that type of things and get down to business and say, we better move here and this is, a, this is an opportunity that's not going to last past next month. We better make a decision and let's move with it. So in those cases that my community has moved ahead with self-government and we have developed that capacity and I think uh, I'm going to guess we have probably less than 20 people directly involved with land management out of a population, band population of about 900 and administering, uh, you know, to over 10,000 residents. So. Uh, but um, we have an intergovernmental affairs department which complements uh, the lands department, meaning that uh, any uh, issues that happen with the, within the uh, territory of, of, of our nation, uh, there has to be consultation and like you, like government, we would charge for reviewing an application. Somebody wants to put a bridge uh, across a river let's say at Arrow Lakes, uh, and there has to be certain uh, collaboration. So we have to have our own anthropologists or archeologists or whatever involved. We say, here's the fee, pay it. And we'll send our people there and we review it and report back and then we either do business or we don't. So that takes time and it takes resources and it takes experts. Uh, and we have engineers and planners and that sort of thing. So West Bank is, is, is much more advanced than some of the other communities, all in all diversion of, of uh, capabilities and I think we all learn from one another. I've uh, for one have been throughout different parts of the world, uh, been in in uh, United States, I met with the Navajo. Navajos are the largest group of indigenous peoples uh, in North America. There's over, there's, uh, there's over, uh, there's, uh, there's over four million people, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And I could be off uh, a bit, but to the largest population, they control uh, by voting um, governors in four states, 
and I've met with them, and they say we vote collectively, we vote on block, and, and we need this governor here in Colorado or in New Mexico or in Arizona or whatever to say, look, uh, we need to advance education, we want gaming rights and so forth, so we better vote to know we've got the right government that's going to support us. So that's how engaged they are, and I've learned from that. A lot of uh, peoples uh, throughout the country could have a lot more political clout if they band together. Not like society to get together and collaborate, but ideally you could be smart and you could plan for it, and you could change the course of history. Um, and, and I think those things happen, but it's about what you know. And, and I, we've learnt in dealing with the tribes in the uh, in, um, United States, and they've learnt from us. They were really interested when I started talking about self-government and uh, land code development. They were really thrilled, and they said, we learnt, they said. So, we exchange a lot of ideas, and that's why working with these institutions now, with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the groups now to collaborate and to say, how can we advance ourselves more, whether it's capacity development, whether it's understanding, or how do we, uh, what do we know about pipelines, for example? What do we know about oils? Well, what did anybody know about them before they started making them? You learn, and that's what we're doing. We're learning, and we're learning very quickly. We're knowing now, that uh, we just can't say, here's a chunk of land, here's a lease to it. Somebody pay the lease and say goodbye, you develop it, and that's it. Now I see First Nations saying that they want to be involved in the development of it. You don't just give away uh, uh, three quarters of the farm. You may want to keep, uh, keep uh, the majority of that farm for the future. And that's where First Nations, that's how First Nations, I think, are thinking right now, to be involved as partners, joint partners, or maybe doing the developments themselves and it's a learning capacity. Land management is, is certainly an advancement. There's always changes, there's always uh, technological advancements, GIS mapping and all these types of things. All has to be learned and practiced and to give good governance, to be able to properly design your lands and to have environmental laws in place and to know what that all means. These are all things that, that, that happen. We all share, share that and I think that's the beauty of my involvement with the Lands Board, it's a family. It's First Nations working collectively, and we willingly share. You may spend on one law, piece of law, maybe $30,000 to $50,000, develop one law. If you can share that one law to the masses, pretty soon you can, collectively, you can reduce the costs of governance by using some of those, um, that wording that might be in those laws. And, and that's the type of sharing, so it's a quick process, and it, it is working, and I think it's, uh, I think it's, partly what government has to do. I've been in politics a long time. You know, I was first elected to council in 1974, and that's a long time ago, and so I have some involvement. And I've been to various departments, Indian Affairs and other governments, and I go in some of the departments, and I can tell you firsthand, some of these departments don't know what's across the door in that other department. They have no idea. And I've been to situations where they didn't have any ideas, and I figured it out and said, well, by God, maybe we can take advantage of this. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more. There was, I saw a question earlier. Did you still have a question? Has a land board been working directly with the Selco team, helping them with uh, everything that they more or less gain through the title claim? We have been involved. I know the uh, former chief, uh, Roger William. Uh, I know his, some of his community members and elders and that sort of thing. I was, I was involved. I was asked by the law firm when they were uh, in their uh, Supreme Court of Canada process to help try and negotiate a settlement between the province of British Columbia, the federal government, and the First Nations up there. So they are involved to this extent. They, they tell us that if we can get the amendment in place, they are willing to work with us and they want to move uh, the advancement so they have clarity of jurisdiction over those Aboriginal title lands. Right now, they're still in negotiations and to my knowledge, they haven't reached any final consensus or final agreement. And I, I stand to be corrected perhaps, but to my knowledge, they haven't done so. They have indicated to us and they've given us uh, their support saying, we can get this amendment through, they would be involved. And I think this would open up things for many other uh, First Nations as well, because when I go to First Nation communities, uh, always, always 
one person or another will say, it's all fine to have the jurisdiction over these reserve lands that we have, that we're standing on right now, for example, but our lands are bigger than that. Some of them may be postage stamp in size, but it has to be bigger. We have to have some say over here. That's our history. These are where 14,000 uh, plus year old caves and artifacts exist. We better have some say over there. So yes, uh, Honeywood Teen and Williams Lake uh, area are supportive. Uh, the last call I've had with them to move ahead and we hope to advance this. It's discussions now with the federal government to say, open up this. And there's probably gonna be collaboration required with the province of British Columbia, undoubtedly and other provinces as we move ahead with this concept. I don't know if I should say this, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> when I was involved in assisting the uh, lawyers uh, in the Supreme Court of Canada case, they wanted to, to end it, to, to move ahead quickly. And uh, I can tell you, when I dealt with the uh, Williams Lake Tribal Council, the, uh, the, the six uh, member bands there, uh, four of them were active trying to get the settlement. Two of them backed away. And when those two backed away right at the beginning, I think government saw a bit of, uh, a, bit of uh, a breaking up and they did not complete the mandates that we were on negotiations from that particular year from August to almost November. It all was for nothing. And the chiefs were very upset at the uh, Williams Lake Tribal Council. They, uh, when, the, uh, when the provincial uh, negotiator came back to deliver the message, well, what is it that we're going to offer? They offered zero. No lands, no economic development opportunities, zero. The chiefs, I think if they could have killed and got away with it, they may have. They referred me and a discussion uh, in a heated, heated backroom involvement was, it's just like that what happened in the mid-1800s when they were trying to protect their lands and they reached an agreement, a supposed agreement with the, uh, the Dominion government of British Columbia and Canada to say, let's see if we can resolve this and have some frank treaty discussions. Their chiefs were hanged when they were brought into uh, Williams Lake and some of them were brought down here to the Begbie building in, in Victoria and hanged here. So they said, just like it was then, is the same response we got from the governments. And I can tell you the frustration. You can imagine these chiefs, uh, we were working there all that, uh, all that part of the year and we had commitments and promises all started out great, but things change. Maybe people change, maybe internal government changes in, in their thinking, but I can tell you, First Nations have troubles dealing with First Nations, uh, dealing with governments who are supposed to deal efficiently and effectively and fairly I can tell you firsthand from being involved in it, it has not been fair. It has not been, and it needs to be. And that's how we're going to advance uh, settlements in this country and move this country ahead if there's fairness and justice and recognition of that. So these are all things that are elementary perhaps to some of us, but to, to the general public, maybe that's not. I don't know. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and honor. Thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Robert, once again, for coming out and speaking to us. Thank you, everyone who attended, uh, for your interest and engagement. Excellent questions. Um, look forward to seeing you again in future talks. Thanks. Bye for now. Thank you, sir.